Good evening and welcome to New Life. I'm Terry Knight, the pastor here at New Life Community Church, and I thank you so much for turning us on, tuning us in. I trust, as always, that the Lord's going to bless you up one side and down the other as we fellowship together here for the next several moments. Boy, I've got me a good cup of coffee, and I'm all set and ready to watch New Life. Let me encourage you to do the same. Let me ask you a question as we get started tonight. What do you know about marriage and family? And what do you know about the Bible when it comes to sexual relations? Well, doesn't that sound like an odd question? What do you know about the Bible with regards to sexual relations? You know, the Bible is the, the document that introduces us to sexual relations. A lot of people don't know that. A lot of people frown from that and run from that. But it's true. And we've been looking at that for the last couple of weeks in a roundabout way. We're going to explore it some more as we attempt to wrap up this particular part of this teaching. Now, I trust that you've been listening and learning and reading the Bible and being challenged with regards to this particular topic. And if you've missed any of these uh, programs, let me encourage you, you can find these on our website. And the web address is located right there, nlccalive.org, not com, but org. Pick it in, go to the little toolbar on top and uh, find the video link. And all of these television programs, tele telecast if you please, can be viewed in their entirety from our website. And you can kind of look at it on your own time. You can slow it down, pause it, back it up, whatever you need to do. We also have a presence on YouTube, and you'll discover that when you go to those videos. We'd encourage you to take full advantage of that technological advancement that we have today. How cool is it to be in all of those places at one time? Or we're going to continue on tonight with this teaching, Enough Said Already. I want to read one verse in your hearing. This entire series is based on Genesis, the early chapters in Genesis, but we're looking at a lot of other passages. Tonight is no exception. And we're going to go, if you would please, to 2 Timothy, 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 22. And the Bible puts it this way. Flee the evil desires of youth and pursue righteousness, faith, love, and peace, along with those who call on the Lord out of a pure heart. 2 Timothy chapter 2. Pray with me. Lord, I thank you so much for the opportunity that I have to come before every member of this television audience tonight and share again this good news, gospel message, the fact that Jesus has come, that we might have life and that more abundantly. And Lord, I pray you'd open our hearts and our minds as we look at this very significant subject matter tonight. Guard our hearts, I pray, in Jesus' name, amen and amen. Will you keep your Bibles handy and uh, stay tuned? Lord willing, I'll be back here at the end of the program to wrap things up and to tell you a couple of things going on here at New Life. God bless you. Somebody help me understand what premarital means. I do premarital counseling. That means I counsel folks before they get married. Premarital. That's before marriage. Applied to stated topic, premarital sexual relations. That sexual relations between folks what ain't married to one another. Are you with me? Now, the King James, the old King James Version calls it fornication. Fornicating. That's a word we use a lot nowadays, don't we? You hear about Leroy, I've been fornicating up in here. You don't hear a whole lot about that. The original word, the Greek word, is pornea. you got to be kidding me. Nope, I ain't a kid. If you go to Galatians chapter 5, beginning around verse 19, there's a list of the, the works of the flesh, sinful activities that people engage in. Do you believe that word fornication or pornea or sexual immorality is listed there? It's one of the works of the flesh. Sexual immorality, that is an immoral or improper way to practice sex. Now watch this. I'm going to be speaking against premarital sex for just a few moments. Used to be, and I can remember this, used to be that this message was reserved for young teens. A preacher would say to young teens, now y'all don't be doing that now, you hear? 
But sadly, with the disdain for marriage in our culture today, this message is not at all reserved for just young teens. By the same token, there was also a time when this message would have been directed mainly to the young men in the congregation. That, too, is no longer the case. Though it has, since the very beginning, taken two to tango. Say, hey, man, if you know what I'm talking about. Now, I can't dance like Mark Gunger, but I'll, I'll just do this thing. <laughs> Though from the very beginning it has taken two to tango, it seems there is an epidemic, an epidemic, I say, among young girls today pursuing men instead of being satisfied to be the pursued. Am I right? Now listen, it's not my position, but those who are quote unquote in the know today, they seem to support premarital sex as the expected norm. It starts with children in elementary school. Somebody say, God help us. Am I telling you the truth? Yes, I are. Number six on your study notes. I hasten to this in case I get carried away. Maybe you're thinking, well, Pastor Prude, I mean, Pastor Terry, what's the big deal about sexual relations before marriage? That's a good question, isn't it? What's the big deal? It's simple. You want to know the simple answer? Fill this in with me. God said don't do it. Really? And you know what? God is pretty sharp when it comes to these things. Because he invented marriage. And he ordained it, mandated that it would continue as he purposed it to be. Pastor Terry, I've read all through that Bible, and I ain't read in here anywhere where it says, Thou shalt not fornicate. I just have not been able to find that. I done read Leviticus and everything. I can't find that in here nowhere. Well, let me help you. Go with me to 2 Timothy, chapter 2, verse 2. Uh, chapter 22, chapter 2, verse 22. If you find 2 Timothy chapter 22, we're in trouble. Somebody done been editing up in here. <laughs> 2 Timothy 2, 22, here's what it says. Paul writing to young Timothy. Timothy was a young man in the faith, aspiring to be a, a pastor, if you please, or a leader among the church. And Paul says to him, Timothy, flee the evil desires of you. Somebody help me understand what flee means. Run. Run! Get out of him. Flee the evil desires of you and pursue righteousness, faith, love, and peace. In other words, spiritual fruit that comes from a spirit baptism. Flee those rotten things and pursue righteousness, faith, love, and peace along with those who call on the Lord out of a pure heart. The New Living Translation puts it this way, run from anything that stimulates youthful lust. Well, why? Why does God want to be like that? He's always wanting to be so hard to get along with, right? Wrong. God's not trying to be hard to get along with. God's got a plan for your life, and it's a good plan. Go with me to 1 Corinthians, if you would, chapter 6 and verse 13. 1 Corinthians 6, 13, I want you to see this. latter part of verse 13 says this, and he's talking about food there, so I'm not taking this out of context, but he makes some application. But in the middle of this verse, he changes up and he says this. The body is not meant for sexual immorality. Would anybody care to guess what sexual immorality is in the original? Pornea, fornication, sexual immorality. The body is not meant for sexual immorality. Any questions? 
pretty plain, isn't it? But for the Lord and the Lord for the body. You getting this? Look at verse 15. Do you not know that your bodies are members of Christ himself? When we become born again, we are connected to the body of Christ. We're part of the body of Christ. That's plumb spiffy right there. Shall I then take the members of Christ and unite them with a prostitute? What do you think, church? I'll agree with the writer. Never should we take the members of Christ and unite them with a prostitute. Verse 16. Do you not know that he who unites himself with a prostitute is one with her in body? For it is said, look how he applies uh, Genesis 2.24 here. The, it is said the two will become one flesh. Wow. Verse 17. But he who unites himself with the Lord is one with him in spirit. Verse 18. Flee. There it is again. Paul didn't tell Timothy one thing. And then go down to Corinth and tell them people something else. You know why? Because it wasn't Paul's dealings to start with. God had impressed upon Paul what he was to write down to be a part of his word. Flee, he says, verse 18, from sexual immorality. Yes, poor Nia. All Look at this. All other sins a man commits are outside his body. But he who sins sexually sins against his own body. Can you understand that when I lie to you, I'm sinning against you? When I cheat, yeah, you don't just cheat yourself. When you cheat, you're cheating someone else, taking something from someone else that doesn't belong to you. Stealing, you don't just steal from yourself. You, you engage somebody else in that. Killing, these are sins that you foist upon other people, but not so sexual sin. Here's the answer to why not do this other things are foist upon other people this is something that you do to yourself there are repercussions to this sin unlike any other beloved watch this it wreaks havoc spiritually physically mentally emotionally and spiritually not just spiritually our presenter did a phenomenal job yesterday afternoon of talking to us about that in a closed session dealing with some issues I dare not go into on Sunday morning in a, in a mixed congregation, at least not this Sunday morning. Why did God tell us to run away from pornea? Number seven on your study note. I have hinted around about this. I'm just going to flat out say it right now. God has a better plan for your life than the constant drama and guilt and anxiety and despondent emotions that are part and parcel of the fornication package. God has something better than that for you. Beloved, let me just conclude this this morning by saying this. Very simply, those who promote such a lifestyle to you of pornea or sexual immorality, or those who promote it before you or upon you, they are not only attacking you, which they are, but they are also disagreeing with what God said in His Word and portraying to you that that's okay. And it's not okay. It's disobedience. And it is presently discombobulating, and it is eternally dangerous. You glad you came this morning? I don't know about you, but I'll be glad when we get off this topic. Let me hit this real quick, and I'm, I'm going on down the road. Let me say this to you this, mor this morning as a, by the way, men and women who decide it's a good idea to move in with each other. Does anybody know what I'm talking about? I think the, the uh, therapists call it cohabitation <laughs> nowadays. Back when I was a little boy, they called it, you don't want to care, hear what they called it. But any individuals that 
move in with each other and they carry on sexual activities apart from the commitment of marriage. These ones are guilty of fornication, improper use of sex. It is biblically wrong. Pastor Terry, you can't say that nowadays. Yes, I can. I just said it, and I'll say it again. It is biblically wrong. There's a lot I don't know. There's a lot I do know. This I know. I done took and read it. I'm just sharing it with you. Don't shoot the postman for crying out loud. But it's biblically wrong. Always has been. It always will be unless you choose to edit out what God put in here. Even secular, listen to me. Even secular sources today are realizing that cohabitation doesn't work out in the long haul. It amazes me when the world finally confirms what God said. Don't that just blow your mind? And, and I guess I kind of understand that because that may even sound arrogant what I just said. I didn't mean for it to. Now, I have just described for you in perhaps a subliminal, subliminal fashion, it's easy for you to say, just described for you the primary culprits regarding the assault on marriage and family in our culture today. How was that, Pastor Terry? It was fornicating. Those who are practicing sexual relations outside the commitment of marriage. Now watch this very closely. I guarantee you, if you poll the average fornicator today, can't you just see a survey like that? Excuse me, I'm a man on the street. Are you a fornicator? <laughs> and that's actually not real hard to find nowadays. You see the t-shirts that pretty much say, I'm a fornicator. It doesn't say it like that, but you know what I'm talking about. But if you poll the average fornicator today and you ask them, are you against marriage? Are you dismantling marriage? Are you redefining marriage? You get, no, 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 not at all. I'm not against marriage. I'm not redefining marriage. I'm not dismantling marriage. And yet by their actions, somebody say actions. Not their beliefs, but by their actions. They are singly doing more to dismantle marriage and family than any other group. Am I right? Now, I could, trust me, I could, Spend a crazy amount of time, crazy, mm -hmm. a crazy amount of time <laughs> dissecting and describing before you this morning the components of adultery and talk about all them adulterous people out there. And I could dissect uh, and, and embellish for you all the little components of divorce and such perversions as what we're told, called today LGBT, lesbian, gay, bisexual, and transgender. I could dissect all of that and describe all of that to you in hard detail and argue how those things are destroying marriage and family. However, they all come under the general umbrella of sexual immorality. And the same arguments apply to them as does fornication or sex outside biblical, godly marriage. Question I'm going to seek to answer next week. I was going to do it today, but as you can see, I ran out of time. You guys are going to have to start listening faster. That's just all there is to it. How in the world does a culture move from predominantly God-fearing, and go back and read the historical documents, 
How do we move from being predominantly God-fearing to God-less in such a short period of time? Who is that someone somewhere that has foisted all this upon us? We'll talk about that. This morning, I may be speaking to someone who has fallen into the trap of pornea, sexual immorality, sexual sin, the improper use of sex. Can these sins be forgiven, Pastor Terry? Can they be forgiven? Man, I've done some awful things. I've done some awful things to myself. I've done some awful things to other people. I've done some awful things to my family. Can this stuff be forgiven? Yep. No question about it. The Bible teaches me in Romans that where sin did abound, grace did much more abound. That's good news right there. Good news. That's not a license to sin, beloved. In fact, Paul says, shall we continue to sin that grace may abound? He says, God forbid, dummy. I throw the dummy in there. He was thinking it. (laughs) Just bore out in the Greek. (laughs) Absolutely, these things can be forgiven. But watch this. With sexual sin, the perpetrator actually sins against self. Somebody help me here. Who's the most difficult person in the world to forgive? Yourself. Yourself. So these kind of things take time. Often God is willing to forgive us long before we're willing to forgive ourselves because of things that we do and the guilt that's associated with it. And I'm telling you, there's some deep guilt and Just all kind of yucky emotions that come along with a lifestyle of sexual immorality. It takes time. It takes counsel. I urge you to seek that. Beloved, we're here today. New Life Community Church is not about beating people up. In other words, bringing you in here and saying, all right, all y'all sit down. Now I'm going to kill you in Jesus' name. That's not what we're all about. Y'all, you bunch of heathen, you. I get up and be happy and go on. We're not about tearing people down, but we're about building people up and beloved if you have some sin like that in your life I'm here to tell you there's forgiveness complete total forgiveness if you've been caught up in a in an adulterous relationship if you've been caught up in that monster called divorce God's not happy about divorce but God doesn't throw people away like old socks with holes in them God can Change all of that. Make it brand new. You know one of the coolest things to me about church and Christianity and heaven and God and the whole nine yards is you can take some broken knucklehead that's just, can I say screwed up? Can I say that? that ha- I'm going to. That has screwed up royally. And God can get a hold of their heart and change them. And what was no longer is. And they can start all over again. They can start over all over again when they're three or 13 or 15 or 25 or 70. And I led a gentleman, a good friend of mine, to the Lord in the hospital here a couple of years ago. He's 87 years old, never been born again. Led him to the Lord on a hospital bed. And I trust he's in heaven today. His life was changed. It's unbelievable. That's good stuff right there. I don't care who you are. Beloved, we're going to wrap it up right there tonight. Can I say this to you before we go off the air? And I have just a little bit of time left tonight. It's amazing to me how even the church, those who claim to be followers of Christ, we tend to emphasize certain sins and minimize other sins. Isn't it true it's just human nature to want to point at other people and and to uh, spiritualize what we do and despiritualize what other people do? Beloved, I may be talking to somebody tonight that you're engaged in a premarital or extramarital affair of some kind, and it's wrecked your life. And you want to point fingers at other people. In fact, often we find that men want to point fingers at women, just like Adam did you know, thousands and thousands of years ago. And the women want to point back to the men, and we're all pointing back at one another, blaming this one and blaming that one. Here's a novel idea. 
why don't we take responsibility for our own actions, in particular the men. And I may be speaking, probably am speaking to some men tonight. I want to encourage you, if you'll pardon the colloquialism, I want to encourage you to man up and be a real man of the Word. Read the Word of God. Study the Word of God. Discover God's plan for your personal life. Now, I'm not talking about you and Jesus got your own thing going because you don't. You have to factor the church into that, and that involves other people. But I'm talking about a relationship where you engage individually. You become a part of the church and discover God's truth for you and your part uh, among the body of Christ, your spiritual gifts, and you really begin to engage that. Men, are you listening? You know, this would solve all kind of problems in our society today if men would just simply understand what God's Word says to us, the Bible, and assimilate it into their own life and allow that to serve as an instruction manual for their own life. I want to challenge you to that extent. You said, Pastor Terry, are you all of that? Have you manned up? Have you done all these things? Well, I've been striving to do that in the power of the Spirit for almost 40 years now, and it's a wonderful life. And I understand both sides of the fence. I haven't always been a follower of Christ, so I know what it's like to go from doing my own thing, as someone mentioned to me this week, to doing God's thing. That doesn't mean we're perfect. It certainly doesn't mean I'm perfect. If I took the perfect test, I probably would make maybe a high D. I, I don't know. <laughs> I'm not perfect, and those who know me best know that that's true. But it's not about my perfection. It's about God's perfection and what He can do in and through us as we strive to follow after His perfect plan. That's very key. Maybe we'll talk about that and teach on that more in depth in the days to come. Beloved, if you've gotten caught up in some kind of a, an affair, whether it's premarital or extramarital, I pray for you, and I pray that you'd understand from God's Word that you can be delivered from that. Now, when I say that, some people are like, what are you talking about delivered? Man, I'm having a great time out here whooping it up, doing my own thing. Hey, look at me. Can I see your eyeballs? I know how you feel way down inside where it really matters. And guys, you can put off all that bravado all you want to. I know about the inside. When you have to lay down all by yourself at some point during the day or get by yourself, I know how you feel and how empty you can feel when you're living your life that way. By the same token, I know how freeing it is when you're living your life in Christ and living according to God's Word. That's what I desire for myself and I desire for you. I trust you'd be challenged and encouraged to that extent. The teachings that you hear on New Life Telecast are taped live, and you hear them almost live and in person here on Sunday evening, but we tape them Sunday morning at 10 o'clock. We'd love to see you, love for you to come out and be a part of what's taking place here. Bring your Bible with you, bring a pen, bring some paper, and learn some things from the Word of God. We also have midweek activities Wednesday evening. We continue on with some teaching. Every other week, first and third, we have small groups. They've been going on for nearly 17 years now. That's a long time to be engaged in small group ministry. And our, it's really a, a great time of praying for one another, caring for one another. Uh, every other week, the second and fourth Wednesday, we're involved in some pretty in-depth teaching with regards to the Bible, some particular topical teaching. We'd love to see you. We'll save you a seat. Well, my time is completely gone. I've just talked myself right out of time. I am Terry Knight, the pastor here at New Life Community Church, wishing you a great week. And remember, my friends, if you don't live it, you don't have it.